Um, I am Lynn Goodhouse, and on behalf of the European Institute for Asian Studies, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar um, on uh, Taiwan's role in the EU's strategic autonomy and diversification of its supply chain. Um, I will not take the floor for too long, as I will pass on the, um, the word to Mr. Eric Famay, our senior associate at the European Institute uh, for Asian Studies, who will be taking up the role, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Lynn, and good morning to all of you, our panelists, our viewers all over the world. For those who do not know the European Asian European Institute for Asian Studies, um, we bring uh, EU policymakers, Asian policymakers, and academics together at our Asia platform here in Brussels, which is actually walking distance from the European headquarters. Now, today, fortunately, it is a digital format. Um, you know, we have COVID, but we have other uh, visitors here in Brussels, which is, uh, for instance, important uh, people from the UK. They may not stay as long as COVID, but we also have uh, the uh, heads of state of the 27 um, uh, EU member countries here today, gathering for a very important EU summit. Um, and I mentioned the summit because uh, it will also lead probably to some of our panelists, and I mean the people from the European Parliament, to join us a little later during uh, the seminar. But uh, the, uh, the advantage here of the digital format is, of course, that we can have very high-profile visitors um, and panelists uh, also from uh, Taiwan. And definitely we have uh, today two key persons for the relations between Europe and uh, Taiwan uh, joining us from Taipei, and I will introduce them and the panelists as they take the screen a little later. I would like to uh, um, mention here that um, uh, it is possible for all viewers to put questions. You have a chat box, I think, on um, uh, YouTube and Facebook, and so you can file your questions. Please uh, help the moderate in, moderator in giving the, uh, the panelists a hard time in getting uh, tough questions. Um, now, uh, right, I, I think uh, before, I would also like to make some uh, further introductory comments, kind of setting the scene for the panelists. But before we do that, I would like to ask um, the uh, Taiwei chief, Taipei chief representative uh, uh, here in Brussels, uh, Mr. Tsai Ming Yen, to take the screen. Uh, Mr. Tsai is the de facto ambassador of Taiwan to the European Union and Belgium, and uh, I'm sure he has an important message to tell us. So please, Ambassador Tsai, take the screen. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, it's really a pleasure to be part of this program. Um, I think I would like to uh, uh, express my uh, thanks to the EIAS at the very beginning uh, for organizing today's event and uh, putting me on the agenda. Um, I think it's very timely for us to uh, have discussion over EU's uh, strategic autonomy, supply chain security, and the potential cooperation between EU and Taiwan. We know the um, impacts of the pandemic on our um, economics are far reaching. So EU has um, decided to um, highlight the importance to pursue strategic autonomy and uh, uh, supply chain security. So I think um, in this um, process, um, you may need to go further to identify what kind of uh, strategic items or important sectors should be covered by EU proposed strategic autonomy and uh, um, supply chain security. Uh, if EU's concerns and the focus go to important items or strategic sectors, such as ICT, AI, semiconductor, um, IoT, and medical equipment, then I believe Taiwan can become a very important partner, very uh, reliable partner of EU in this regard. Um, I think um, we all know that um, EU and Taiwan are like-minded partners. We uh, share uh, common values on so many things, like uh, democracy, human rights, rule of law, 
openness and the transparency. Also, um, Taiwan has very strong capacity on those uh, important sectors and strategic items that I just mentioned earlier. For example, Taiwan's um, semiconductors are number two biggest in the world, while um, Taiwan's ICT sectors also take up a very high ranking around the world. So I believe this is the reason why the um, United States um, has chosen Taiwan as a very important partner of uh, uh, U.S. proposed economic prosperity network, which also intends to pursue uh, U.S. supply chain security on um, AI, semiconductor, um, ICT, IoT, biotechnology, medical equipment, and some others. So both uh, United States and Taiwan have uh, pledged to pursue a very uh, strong uh, economic prosperity partnership with each other for the future. So um, I'm going to uh, uh, remind um, our good colleagues on light today, everyone, uh, it's about the very good model for the cooperation between the United States and Taiwan, which could become a very good reference for our discussion this morning. And a very good example could um, go to the cooperation between um, US and Taiwan on semiconductor sectors. We know United States has been dominating uh, global semiconductor design, while Taiwan is very good, very strong at uh, semiconductor manufacturing and assembling. So um, due to uh, a very clear picture and the strong potential for closer partnership between US and Taiwan um, on semiconductors, Taiwanese company, TSMC, which is the biggest semiconductor producer in the world, has decided to invest more than 12 billion US dollars to build up a factory in the United States. And uh, uh, also many other Chinese companies, which are the suppliers and the contractors of United States, uh, of uh, TSMC, they also follow uh, TSMC's um, decision to uh, open up their production lines in the United States in the near future. So uh, what can we see is that the very close partnership between US and Taiwan semiconductor um, sectors could uh, create at least uh, three uh, very important benefits to these two countries. Number one is that uh, both uh, US and Taiwan uh, could uh, work together to build a very reliable and secure supply chain for themselves in terms of semiconductor. And number two um, is that um, these two countries' semiconductors uh, will be able to tie up with each other closely and become a very, very important driving force in global semiconductor industries. And number three is that um, the integration between US and Taiwan semiconductor sectors can also help to uh, create a kind of effect to promote mutual investment and uh, uh, industrial clusters in each other. So I think this is a very successful win-win uh, um, case that we uh, may need to uh, consider when we are here to uh, talk about what kind of law Taiwan might be able to play in uh, EU's strategic autonomy and supply chain security. We know the uh, investment and trade partnership between EU and Taiwan has been very um, solid since past few years. And uh, the potential for our cooperation on uh, supply chain security could be also very promising. Um, what we need to do now more than ever is to offer more, uh, you know, um, um, new and uh, strong impetus to push forward our partnership uh, for the future. Uh, in this process, I believe we need to have more strategic thinking. We also need to make some important, even uh, even difficult political decision. And then we need to take some concrete actions. So uh, we, we can consider to uh, have a very big, uh, big and a very important start. That is to initiate our contact and negotiation over a bilateral investment agreement, BIA, between EU and Taiwan, uh, because a BIA might be able to uh, help us to put a very positive uh, atmosphere for our close uh, partnership. So um, to make all this possible and to make all this moving forward, uh, we may need to have more um, consultation and uh, more opinion exchanges like um, today's uh, meeting. I know this morning we have a very uh, strong and a distinguished group. So I'm looking forward to learning from you on how to make the partnership between EU and Taiwan becoming more solid and uh, more energetic. Uh, in the years to come. So I would like to close my remark right here by wishing a very uh, fruitful and uh, productive discussion this morning. And I also want to express my thanks to everyone online today for paying attention and interest in the issues relevant to the cooperation between you and Taiwan. So I want to thank you all online and uh, let me stop here. Thank you.
Uh, Eric, you are muted. Eric, uh, you are uh, muted. Uh, yes. Sorry. Sorry about that. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you for reaching out to the European Institute for Asian Studies. We will always have a platform if you want to bring Taiwan to the attention uh, of the world. Um, you mentioned a very strong uh, technical uh, ties uh, with uh, the United States. You also mentioned that we share a lot of values, uh, we Europeans, with the Taiwanese. And that reminds me of the words of uh, your uh, out-of-the-box digital minister, Audrey Tang, who recently said, you won't find in Asia a country as European as Taiwan. Now, um, Taiwan, of course, has been uh, very much in the spotlight uh, this year. And I think uh, what is most visible was, of course, uh, Taiwan's response to the COVID crisis and then uh, subsequently to the fact that um, Taiwan was excluded uh, from uh, joining in the discussions and the gatherings of the World Health Organization. Um, uh, yeah, I think that was a big embarrassing moment, definitely for the WHO, and maybe also a little bit to uh, some of us Europeans who thought that maybe the EU could have done just a little bit more of protesting. Of course, we know that Reinhard Butikofer and many other European parliamentarians addressed a letter of protest to the WHO, but that was to no avail. Um, apart from the COVID crisis, I think, uh, and the willingness, by the way, of Taiwan to help the rest of the world, this was very visible. Another thing which, is, uh, which made a lot of uh, uh, noise and uh, got a lot of attention was in February this year when Taiwan had its national election and uh, there was a resounding victory for the uh, seating president Tsai Ing-wen and her Democratic Progressive Party. And um, now I think this reaffirmed uh, that the Taiwanese uh, people, they want to keep the PRC at arm's length, at least politically. And um, so uh, I think uh, also regarding this election, uh, it was quite obvious. And I think uh, it was mentioned uh, in many circles that um, the belligerent uh, uh, rhetoric of the People's Republic um, has in, uh, influenced a lot the outcome of this, this, of this uh, election. Now, one thing uh, that was not so visible, but is equally important, uh, is that, um, uh, you know, as the, the world economy and even our own lives uh, turn digital, the vital role of Taiwan um, as the world's uh, most advanced uh, ICT manufacturer has become even more crucial. Um, indeed, digitalization, it is the future, but it is also the present, and it has a Taiwanese added value embedded. And it is therefore not surprising that despite the fact that uh, world trade is shrinking, um, the uh, exports of uh, Taiwan are doing quite well. And Taiwan has also been, uh, at least at the beginning stage here of this reshuffling of uh, international supply chains, Taiwan seems to have been uh, a winner. So all these factors helped uh, keep Taiwan growing this year, which is quite exceptional. One of the few countries in the world that will achieve a positive GDP growth, I think the government is planning for 2.5% growth, whereas most of the world will see very big uh, uh, sharp falls in GDP growth. And so there's a lot of positive vibe about, uh, about Taiwan, the successful uh, um, uh, tackling of the COVID crisis, the economic uh, success. And this vibe has been picked up by, for instance, the uh, Economist magazine, who in this week's uh, uh, issue has a lead article on Taiwan saying that after maybe a few years of pessimism about the future of Taiwan, um, Taiwan in, 20, uh, in 2020 has turned the clock, which is what the uh, economist writes. Um, meanwhile, of course, uh, on the EU side, we have also reset the clocks. We have a new uh, commission with, uh, uh, led by um, Mrs. van der Leyen. We have a new boss at the European External Action Service, 
uh, Joseph Borrell. And most importantly, that means we have new strategies. And on the Commission side, that is this geopolitical ambition. And uh, on the foreign policy side, there is this uh, new mantra of having strategic autonomy for Europe. Now, um, how all this can be applied to, uh, to strengthen our relations with uh, Taiwan, that is something where I hope and I expect that our panelists uh, will give their opinion on. Now, an EU-Taiwan uh, bilateral investment agreement, it was uh, mentioned already by uh, Ambassador Tsai, it has been under discussion or consideration, should I say, since uh, more than five years, but nothing much has happened. Not even the scoping exercise has uh, started. Um, but that, of course, has not held up uh, EU investment in Taiwan. We will hear later, I think, from uh, Pascal and see the numbers, how uh, the EU is by far the biggest investor in Taiwan. Um, Comparatively, investments out of uh, Taiwan to the EU are quite low and I don't really see the hurdles there. So, to the moderator at least, um, I have a little bit difficulty in um, knowing, in understanding whether the business value of such an EU-Taiwan bilateral investment agreement, whether the business value is as important, as substantial than obviously the political meaning that this uh, agreement would have. And again, I hope that our panelists will address this issue and give us uh, their opinion on that. In any event, we must uh, note that the new Commissioner for Trade uh, on the EU side, Mr. Dombrovsky, he has recently indicated that the um, EU-Taiwan uh, BIA will have to wait the outcome of uh, the discussions with the People's Republic of China. Um, and I think this shows how the EU is still struggling um, to find a way to deal uh, and to foster this relationship with Taiwan without trespassing the red lines which have been imposed by China. And of course, it doesn't help that these red lines are entrenched by the United Nations. But uh, still, what is clear is that if we want to apply as Europeans strategic autonomy on our relations with the EU and with Taiwan, it will require a lot of courage and uh, a lot of firmness. Now, the United States has obviously, um, you know, ruffled uh, the feathers, set up the... They have done quite a lot of things. Um, and even in the UK, I would say there are some glimmers of a more assertive uh, China policy. Um, and uh, therefore, I think, you know, with these new strategies and ambitions at the EU, I really wonder uh, how things will evolve. And also, I ask myself and I wonder whether um, it also has uh, repercussions on the expect expectations from Taiwan's leadership towards the EU. Um, and there is, of course, no better person to uh, answer this question than, I think, our main guest today, and that is uh, His Excellency uh, Minister C.C. C. Chen. He is the uh, Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Economic Affairs in charge of foreign trade. Um, uh, Mr. Chen is a master of law um, he has had several assignments uh, in the Bureau of Foreign Trade in Taiwan, where he became the Director General before being appointed Deputy Minister of Foreign Trade earlier this year. I think last month, uh, uh, Mr. Chen, you were uh, leading the Taiwanese delegation to Washington to discuss uh, with the United States on a Taiwan-US Economic Prosperity Partnership Agreement. Um, also important to mention, um, apart from his time at the ministries in Taipei, uh, um, uh, Minister Chen has had plenty of overseas assignments uh, in Washington, in Singapore, and also in Brussels. So uh, Mr. Chen is familiar with our institute, has been there, and we're glad to have him back today, even if it's on, in a digital format. So Your Excellency, Minister Chen, 
please give us your uh, comments. Thank you, thank you, Eric. It's a profoundly uh, honor for me to be able to participate in this virtual event. As you mentioned, I've been stationed in Brussels and uh, working with our commission colleagues. Uh, your remarks remind me uh, when I just arrived at Brussels and one of our good friends from the commission, he told me what is commission aimed for. He told me that the EU believe a more connected world a more collaborated world, a more liberal trade order will help to make peace through economic cooperation. And that's the ideal, that's the objective of forming the EU. And now when I sometimes complain to him, why things move so slowly? And he told me the European countries are with a long history of culture and civilization. Things move slowly, but on the right track and right trajectory. And sometimes we talk about uh, WTO, and uh, he was very optimistic uh, since uh, the collab of Soviet Union and China joined the WTO. Now the whole world is going to be globalized. Yet, uh, as you mentioned uh, very well, I was stationed in Washington in the past couple of years where I had the opportunities to take part in some of the conversations with uh, the USTR and Mr. Lighthizer and the advisor to the President Trump, uh, Peter Navarro, in their uh, workshop or uh, speeches, uh, they point out a fact that uh, the liberal economic order actually is not as ideal as we have seen. Uh, first of all, they mentioned about the economic coercion by the People's Republic of China. They mentioned about uh, the people throughout China, the regime, very special. They can uh, be so focused that whatever they want to produce, there will be an overcapacity. Uh, the U.S. also concerned with uh, a regime where uh, the rule of law is only on the text, but not on the implementation. So uh, the U.S. administration started some unilateral action and which is not well received even by the European Union, the most traditional ally to the US. So, and the secondly, uh, this year we also noticed the COVID-19 hit the world. And COVID-19 uh, made the world, the supply chain becomes so fragile. Uh, because of COVID-19, um, many countries now suddenly realize their supply chain is actually so much relying on one country, which namely China. Uh, in a globalized world, ideally everything will be made everywhere, but the fact is one third of the manufacturing is produced in China. So when COVID hit China, uh, the whole, whole world suffers. And lastly, but not least, is a competition with China. From the EU's perspective, the Chinese industrial subsidies, they, are, uh, they, they are never uh, satisfy the desire to acquire critical technologies. And the one belt, one road to uh, exercise their influence beyond borders and their treatment of Hong Kong and Xinjiang uh, is a fundamentally different in value, fundamentally different in the regime, fundamentally different in what we believe. And that is how I understand uh, President uh, von der Leyen uh, will say EU's uh, policy is to have an open strategic autonomy. So I understand EU would like to shape a fairer and more sustainable globalization. And the EU would like to build stronger alliances with like-minded partners. And the EU would like to create a more diversified, resilient, and secure value chains. So EU would like to uh, maintain its com competitiveness by open environment and also reserve its resilience and to safeguard its economic security. Next slide. And what, how does the EU will, will achieve that goal? Uh, I also understand the approach is, is 
to get aligned with like-minded like like partners, especially in the Asia Pacific. So uh, this is uh, uh, many years in the making uh, for the EU's uh, gradually form its alliance network. EU has a free trade agreement with Korea. EU has a free trade agreement with Japan. EU has a free trade agreement with Vietnam. EU has a free trade agreement with Singapore. And EU is negotiating free trade agreement with the Philippines. And EU is also negotiating a free trade agreement with Indonesia. So the goal, although is political, but the method and the means are economic. But if you look at this map, what is missing? It's missing Taiwan, such an important, like-minded and reliable partner in the region. Uh, why I can say Taiwan is an important and reliable partner to EU, uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, draw your attention to take a look how the European companies view Taiwan. First of all, uh, EU is Taiwan's largest uh, foreign direct invest, a source of foreign direct investment. More than 50 billion euro has been invested in Taiwan in stock. And the investment focus on the sectors of uh, green energy, semiconductor, smart manufacturing, and retail. Uh, more importantly, the 50 billion U uh, euros invested in Taiwan, more than 60% was invested in the past six years. So that show you a trend of how European companies, uh, they view Taiwan. They, they now realize the importance of Taiwan and how Taiwan is reliable and what, how Taiwan can be a good partner. Uh, another example, is, uh, as Ambassador Tsai mentioned very well, uh, our relations with the U.S. In fact, one of the prominent supply chain to the U.S. is Tesla. Uh, Tesla is manufacturing in the U.S. using 75% of its items uh, supplied by Taiwanese suppliers. People will wonder how a component supplied by Taiwan and manufacturing in the U.S. can be competitive in the global market because it's not only the efficiency, it's not only the cost of production, it's the, the value, the system, the regime, the rule of law, the potential intellectual property, and the talents which made uh, the production competitive. So European companies and American companies, they all realize to find a good partner is more important to find a low cost. And on the other hand, next slide. My government uh, view EU is one of our e most important partners. Uh, the, the President Tsai, in her speech on the National Day speech, encouraged our companies to invest in the EU. We like to invest in the EU for cooperation on green energy, on digital transitions, on semiconductors, on telecommunications. And because we also believe in the green energy, renewables, climate uh, neutralities. So that is why uh, we, we, are, we can work with the EU so perfectly. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Ezo is here, as he mentioned, he was talking to my uh, minister this morning uh, about how can we further collaborate on our energy uh, in ventures. And uh, Eric, you asked, why Taiwanese investment in the EU uh, is relatively little compared to EU's investment in Taiwan? Well, I would like to say uh, it remains to be seen because uh, EU's profile needs to be raised in Taiwan. And we need some kind of permanent piece of document to secure our relations. With the US, we have many, many uh, established platform and relations like trade investment framework agreement, like we have a science technology cooperation agreement, but with the EU, so far we have very, very little, if any. So we need to start, like Ambassador Tsai mentioned, to take difficult decisions, to have a more dialogue and discourse, how can we promote our relations and to make it an established one. My good friend, Pascal, when I was in Brussels, 
I constantly sought his uh, wise counsel. He has very, very wise ideas. And one of the ideas we can work together is to, is there, is to have an investment agreement. Uh, why I say that? Because when there's an investment agreement, uh, and with my government's policy to encourage companies to invest in you, then through the investment, we can form a supply chain to the EU. And then that will bring even more supply, even more investment in the EU. And that will make our relations more uh, established, more permanent. Uh, Eric, you mentioned uh, Mr. Dombrovsky, uh, Dombrovsky, Commissioner of Trade, uh, is, was of the opinion that the uh, EU needs to conclude with China for the investment negotiation before uh, the EU can think about Taiwan. Uh, I beg to disagree. Uh, if the EU is always self-censored, uh, what approach and how far EU can reach and take everything uh, as a red line, then uh, I'm afraid and strategic autonomy will never be there. I think the EU, I would advocate, the EU should make its strategy and policy known to the world. In 2015, EU's Trade for All strategy paper say, uh, stated that the EU will explore long-term negotiations on investment with Taiwan. Uh, that was a carefully drafted language. And we are hopeful in the new strategic paper, EU will formulate another language to make uh, how EU can assert it's strategic autonomy to be known to the world. And then we think investment agreement or the intention to start in some sort of investment discussion will be a good starting. With that, uh, I would, would like to conclude and once again, thank the EIS for me, to giving me this opportunity to take part in this very meaningful workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Um, I was uh, thinking about asking all the panelists uh, for the one thing that they feel the EU has to do um, uh, on Taiwan, but you replied already to that question. And uh, uh, basically what you say is that uh, it's all very well, this investment, it's, uh, but we, in order for Europe and Taiwan to be really linked in uh, new uh, forming supply chains, we need something on paper and in that respect, the uh, EU Taiwan BIA is indeed again very important and hopefully indeed um, the EU can uh, speed this up and not waiting uh, for uh, very uh, you know difficult uh, discussions um, with uh, uh, on the uh, agreement with uh, China. Um, you also mentioned that uh, there is need for the EU's uh, profile to be um, it needs to be raised in Taiwan, you said, and uh, our next panelist is ex exactly doing this, even for a very long time. Uh, Mr. Giuseppe Izzo um, has been uh, the chairman, or yeah, the chairman of the European Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan since eight years, and um, so uh, he, in his capacity, he articulates the wishes of the uh, EU business committee, uh, the, the, the businesses in this committee, um, to the Taiwan policymakers with whom he has very uh, good and frequent relations. Mr. Izzo is also the, uh, the boss in Asia for the Italian high-tech semiconductor STM, ST Micro Electronics uh, Company. So, Mr. Izzo, uh, we're very eager to listen to your perspective on uh, the topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric, and uh, uh, good morning um, or good afternoon from here in Taiwan to all the listeners. <clears throat> I will uh, give a few of my uh, perspectives on this very interesting and uh, important topic. Uh, to which I have been exposed uh, since 2013 in various forms, okay, that I will explain later. Um, first, I would like to, uh, to highlight a few uh, very general uh, topics. So, uh, first of all, the coronavirus pandemic uh, has served as a wake-up call for all of us, 
uh, we are uh, now going uh, through a transition uh, to an unknown future, <clears throat> uh, maybe like the, the past or maybe different, not completely different, but definitely we'll have uh, elements of uh, novelty that uh, we, we have to share, all of us together have to share. Okay? Uh, it, in, in the first place, it showed uh, how vulnerable uh, just-in-time business model are to disruptions right? and how essential um, uh, it is that supply chains do not depend on a single source or region. As uh, Deputy Minister Chen was saying, one third of the manufacturing is done in China. And that to, for what I understood last year, China 2025 was aiming at going to 20, from the one third to 50% to 100% of the world manufacturing uh, in the next five years. So uh, th this would be uh, putting all the eggs in a, in a, into a single basket would be a drama uh, because the, the pandemic of today <clears throat> will uh, definitely uh, be followed by other similar situations as we move forward. <clears throat> So, uh, in addition to this uh, contingency, medical contingency, uh, the, this, uh, you know, that has been just one of the latest shocks, uh, th there have been also the geopolitical factors uh, that have caused or are accelerating the rethinking of the global supply chains, especially with the increase in the US-China trade tensions. So far, Taiwan has been a beneficiary of tensions between the United States and, uh, and China uh, because many of the, the firms uh, uh, that had previously invested in China have shifted some of their operations back home in order to avoid American tariffs. Uh, and in this process, they have been encouraged by the government's incentive programs. Uh, the, those returning uh, include bicycle maker giant, uh, long chain paper company, and uh, many technology companies, including Compal and Quanta, and the computer and uh, server uh, area. Uh, investment figures vary according to the source, but the economists reported that investments in factories and other fixed assets in Taiwan reached an all time high last year at NT dollar 4.3 trillion or US dollars 150 billion and are on the track for a similar level this year. Although some are expecting US China tensions to ease under uh, incoming President uh, Joe Biden, the trend to reduce uh, dependence on China and further diversify the supply chain is likely to continue. But obviously, there is a limit to investment in uh, Taiwan, the can given the, the country's so-called five shortages that are land, water, power, workers, and talent. Only so much can be done uh, on a small island that is committed to phasing out nuclear power and that has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Taiwan's population officially started shrinking this year, and the government forecasts is that it will drop from over 23 million people today to 16 by 2070. And this is a big, another wake up call that we have to take into account. So the Taiwanese investors will need alternatives to both China and Taiwan. And uh, as you are probably aware, uh, Taishan have already been diversifying to countries in Southeast Asia for many years, helped by the government's southbound policy. But getting on uh, today's topic, what about the potential for supply chain diversification in Europe? As the like-minded partners in the liberal tradition on issues such as maintaining an open society and a rule-based international trading system, Taiwan and EU should be natural partners. And to some extent, they already are. Okay. 
Europeans have already invested over 59 billion US dollars or more than 50 billion euros in Taiwan, a figure that continues to rise, especially in the, in the past two or three years. But so far, investments have been pretty much one-sided, right? with less than 8 billion, 8 billion euros invested by Taiwanese in Europe. While the EU officials have often chided Taiwan for this lopsided situation, there are very real reasons why Taiwanese have not invested more in Europe. I think you are all familiar with the most common ones, geographical distance, language differences, red tape and regulatory variations between member states, high taxes, and strict labor laws, just to name a few. Another crucial factor for investors to consider is the cluster effect. The semiconductor industry we were talking about before is an example. It requires multiple components and services provided by a variety of companies. So companies in, in sectors like these are unlikely, are unlikely to invest in any given region unless they are confident that their partners in the supply chain will join them or will grow locally. Taiwan's success in the technology sector, as Ambassador Tsai explained very well before, is well known. And the authorities are keen to develop the local wind energy industry. However, there are questions about if the current strategy of imposing local content requirements will be effective. While many of our members in the wind energy industry are investing heavily in Taiwan and support the government's overall objective to develop the local industry, they are concerned that the current strategy is too inflexible to allow local champions to develop and become internationally competitive. I am not an expert on trade deals, as Vice Minister Chen is, but I am not sure how much uh, BIA will help if these issues uh, I have mentioned are not addressed. To my experience, uh, BIA is essential. Uh, I was, ex uh, as Eric uh, said, uh, I have been involved in, as a president or vice president uh, in the European Chamber of Commerce since 2011, 2012, uh, not always as the chairman, uh, but always helping. Okay, and uh, uh, I remember that in 2013, 2012, 2013, we uh, published a study that done with the Copenhagen Institute in Brussels on the on the opportunity of a free trade agreement between Taiwan and uh, and uh, EU. Uh, on the model of the one just done uh, in that period with Korea. Okay, uh, my, my memory is very vivid about that. And we uh, published also the benefit that both Taiwan and the EU will get from such uh, an agreement, especially in the creation of jobs, especially in the EU. Obviously, this was not done. Okay, and uh, two, three years later, the FTA, that is still essential in my view, became a BIA. Uh, that is still uncertain and for the reasons that were explained before. Uh, I believe that this is very important. Uh, personally, I have been supporting it and I will put all my energy to, to, to support it. Last year in February, we also joined a public hearing in the parliament in Brussels on this topic. Okay, so I believe that uh, the, the Taiwan and the EU shall go into a different form of uh, agreement that would not bridge the gap of, uh, of the investments that are too far away, but at least we we'll start facilitating that process of, of bridging. And in doing so, this would create a lot of jobs in Europe. Okay, At the EU level, there are 27 million people without jobs, young people. And I believe that in, uh, in the next two or three, this 27 will become 40 very easily. I believe that after the medieval crisis, there will be an economic crisis that will knock down many European economies. And if nothing is done from you know, the prospect of creating jobs locally and attracting investments to create jobs in Europe, it will be a disaster, okay? So 
obviously we have to be realistic. Uh, business decisions uh, are made very pragmatically. Uh, just to take two examples that were highlighted before, Foxconn and TSMC investments in United States, okay? So they went to invest, not because they like America. They like American and American customers, but they also receive pledges on generous government subsidies. Are European countries or the EU willing to do this? Yes or no? And if not, we are wasting our time. Okay. If yes, we have to see what it is. Okay. Um, this is not to say that more Taiwanese investments in Europe are not possible. Europe is a large market, and it certainly makes sense for geopolitical strategic reasons for Taiwanese to diversify some of their supply chains to Europe. However, Europe will have to work harder to make the overall value proposition for investing in Europe much more attractive than it is now. Just highlighting a level playing field is not enough. Taiwanese companies play globally by the rules, okay, by the law. I believe that all this talk of making supply chains more resilient is based on the premise that we just need, we just believe that we just need to make some minor geopolitical changes to supply chains, uh, but otherwise we return to business as usual. No, it will be a different story. There will be two or three different crises that will be triggered as we move forward. All these situations, all these talks are also ignoring another big elephant or gorilla in the room that is the existential existential threat to, of climate change scientific evidence continues to build showing the rising impact of human caused climate change to have any hope of uh, addressing these we need the wholesale transformation of the economy based on circular business models that drastically reduce the use of natural resources and close loops in production cycles. So far, in the many discussions about supply chains, no one seems to be taking these into serious consideration. I have not read, read any analysis of how supply chain will have to change in line with the shift from a linear to a circular economy. While there have been some examples on the fringes, so far businesses have been slow to adopt circular business models. The electronic, electronics industry, just to make an example that I have been in for, for three decades, is one of the worst of vendors in this regard. Designing components and devices that will be obsolete within two, three years and that cannot be repaired or upgraded. You, all of you may easily think how long is your telephone going to, to last? Two, three years and then you have to buy a new one. Or if you don't buy a new one, it will be difficult to keep it working, okay? so. This is not a good example, also because the, the components are very difficult to, to recycle. This will not change without tough regulations to force a shift from design for obsolescence to design for circularity. Shifting to a circular economy will require a total rethink of supply chains with the goal not just of making production more efficient, but of reducing the overall carbon footprint of the whole product and service life cycle. So these are my initial thoughts, and uh, I would be very happy to answer any questions uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Idzo. You eloquently made the business case for uh, a, a trade and investment agreement with uh, Taiwan. Um, the impression is, of course, that um, 
there is probably more eagerness and willingness uh, to move on the Taiwan side than there is on, on the European side. We need to put a lot of pressure on the, on the EU policy and the executive arm of uh, the European Union. And the institution that is doing that most, uh, uh, you know, for, in a forceful manner is obviously the uh, European Parliament. And uh, we have just been joined by um, Mr. Christoph Hansen uh, from the European Parliament. He's a Luxembourg member there, um, a member also of the e uh, European Parliament for the, the European People's Party, that is the Christian Democrats. Um, most importantly, uh, in his functions at the par Parliament, I believe, is that he is the rapporteur for the future relations uh, with the UK. So obviously, with everything that's going on nowadays in Brussels, uh, this uh, keeps him very, very busy, and maybe he cannot stay with us and join for the full uh, seminar. Um, maybe he can report to us uh, about progress on the UK side. He did that on TV yesterday. Um, but I would put the question to Mr. Hansen is uh, whether you think that the EU will have an agreement with Taiwan earlier than uh, with uh, the UK. Now, having said that, we come to uh, uh, what I would anyway still like to impress on uh, the European parliamentarians and Mr. Hansen here. That is that, um, you know, this concept of EU strategic uh, autonomy, it has various interpretations. And the most striking maybe was from uh, Mr. Stuart Lau, who wondered in a tweet whether this concept of strategic autonomy was basically just a substitute for Emmanuel Macron. And it hints at the fact that not all members are uh, following. And this is the big problem uh, that uh, Mr. Joseph Borrell identified with EU foreign policy, that is that the perception on the risks and what needs to be done, um, if you see it from Warsaw or you see it from Lisbon, it is different. And so what Borrell wants to do is to put all these policymakers from the, uh, the member states together in one room and come up with a strategic compass. And now I think that if this uh, European policy is, as it is always said, value-based and, and going for fairness, obviously the strategic compass should point straight uh, towards uh, Taiwan. Um, I think a lot needs to be done. We mentioned at the beginning, of course, the, uh, the disaster uh, at the WHO where Taiwan is excluded. But Taiwan is being bullied every day. Just last week, we have this PhD student um, in, uh, in, at Stanford University, a Taiwanese guy who wants to participate in a UN-sponsored scientific conference, and he's excluded. So. Taiwan's motto is Taiwan can help, but it must be allowed. And I would say, what do you do when you see bullying? You act. And if, if you're a bystander, you're basically complicit. I think we all have to do our bit. And of course, we've seen the mayor of Prague. We have seen the, the chairman of the Czech Republic uh, Senate going to Taipei. Um, we all have to do our bit, but these, this senator has to be in the Czech Republic from time to time. And there's only so much Australian wine that we can drink. So what can the, the, the parliament do? And what does the parliament intend to do on the issue of Taiwan? With that, uh, sorry, long introduction, I would like to ask Mr. Christoph Hansen to share his thoughts. Yes, uh, good morning uh, to everybody. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I could uh, switch in uh, during um, in between some of my uh, meetings today and um, I, I had uh, in principle another meeting foreseen but that fortunately had been cancelled and therefore I'm able to speak to you directly well uh, you opened uh, the discussion uh, very broadly uh, well with the first question is uh, there going to be a, a trade agreement with uh, the um, uh, with uh, Taiwan before the one with the United Kingdom of course uh, this is still possible at the very moment because we don't uh, see a white smoke uh, coming up somewhere here uh, around uh, the corner in uh, the Berlimont Hill. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, these uh, negotiations are very tricky. Um, 
protests uh, will come after, will follow up uh, to uh, an eventual agreement with the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, this takes usually uh, several months, but in this very uh, moment, we have just a few weeks left. So that will, of course, be more than challenging. And the more days we lose, uh, uh, unlikely, uh, it will, uh, the more unlikely it will become that will be a uh, no deal or something uh, in between as a provisional application that will send at the end. So there we have uh, still a lot of work to go ahead and a lot of uh, compromises to be made from uh, both uh, sides. But uh, I would like to thank you firstly for uh, giving me uh, the opportunity to speak uh, about uh, more positive elements of strengthening the bilateral relations between uh, Taiwan and the EU. And um, uh, it is, has not only been a close uh, matter to my heart, because I'm following it already uh, a long time, because I have been assistant to former MEP Astrid Lulling, who still is the chair of the um, Luxembourg uh, Taiwan Friendship Group uh, back in Luxembourg. So it is a, a, a huge pleasure for me to be here as a Luxemburger, because indeed Taiwan and Luxembourg uh, on the one hand, uh, share many similarities because we are both uh, rather small countries. Uh, Taiwan is bigger than Luxembourg, uh, but we are as well uh, located in the center of our respective uh, region and giving uh, and we are giving a high priority uh, to ICT companies, for example, and we are serving uh, as such as, as well as a hub and an entry door uh, to the wider markets in our respective uh, region. So um, the economic relations between uh, um, uh, Taiwan and the EU, uh, and on the other hand, uh, we continue to um, intensify an impressive uh, pace. So the EU uh, was Taiwan's uh, fourth biggest trading partner in uh, uh, 2018, while ta Taiwan was the EU's 15th uh, trading partner. Uh, so in terms of uh, foreign direct investment, the EU is the largest investor in Taiwan uh, at this moment, amounting for more than uh, 50 billion euros in 2019 and accounting for roughly 31% of Taiwan's uh, total inward foreign direct investment. So Taiwan's cu cumulative foreign direct investments uh, in the EU has as well reached uh, nearly 8 billion euros with an upward trend as well. So over 60% of these investments have been made over the pa only the past uh, five years. So I'm, I'm very confident that this uh, historic demonstration of close economic ties will even blossom further uh, when the world enters the post-COVID area. And on a personal note, I believe that the exemplary handling of the pandemic by the Taiwan Taiwanese government and their effective efforts to contain the spread uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic make it even more uh, unacceptable that Taiwan is not a member of the WHO. Uh, and uh, for those who uh, are following me already longer, you, you remember that I said already in 2018 that Taiwan uh, has remained uh, the blind spot uh, of the EU trade policy uh, in, um, in a, a huge uh, economic area. So unfortunately, this is still the case today. And as you know, um, uh, we fully uh, back uh, a bilateral investment agreement and that this is not just me saying it, it is uh, the majority of my political group, but uh, as well, uh, the other political groups are regularly on uh, this uh, line as well. So we are making a lot of pressure uh, on the Commission to start finally a scoping exercise, which would, which would be uh, the first step uh, towards uh, an, an FTA as well. Uh, so um, the, the latest it, uh, reiteration of this uh, has been uh, with the adoption of the Common Commercial Policy uh, report um, uh, from 2000 uh, that we adopted in 2020 now in September and uh, but we have as well uh, insisted as you know uh, we have a new trade commissioner uh, the executive vice president uh, Valdis Dombrovskis and in the letter confirming his nomination from the European Parliament we has a, have as well uh, um, underlined again that uh, uh, we should finally start uh, the scope of this necessary scoping exercise uh, because uh, a BIA with Taiwan would underline that the EU and Taiwan are like-minded uh, trading partners and it would help, it would help uh, to protect uh, European investors' rights and diversify as well uh, the supply chains. And we are now talking, uh, and you have been talking just uh, before about uh, the so-called open strategic autonomy. Uh, whatever that means, I have still some doubts because there is as well uh, some concept in that that I can't uh, exactly uh, supports, uh, for example, um, the reshoring of production to the European Union. This is, of course, uh, a reaction to 
um, the shortage or shortcomings we had in certain uh, goods during the pandemic when it comes to um, um, some medical uh, equipment, but as well um, some active substances, for, for example, antibiotics, where we largely depend on imports from India and from China. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, not very uh, well. Th this resilience has been strengthened, but I think reshoring is not the answer. I think we have to diversify uh, our supply chains. Yes, there I agree, and therefore we have to diversify as well uh, our uh, network of uh, free trade agreements and uh, as well uh, from uh, with the BIA with Taiwan. This could be a, a huge step forward as well. Uh, so I think it's more important to give our uh, companies uh, new uh, markets and new possibilities uh, to get their supplies from. That would help to get our re resilience. And if that is uh, the uh, aim of the strategic autonomy, then I can support it. But all this uh, uh, protectionist um, uh, thinkers in the European Union that think we can take somehow everything back, produce everything is, uh, um, in, in the European Union, they are just uh, not uh, aware how global supply chains uh, work. They are just not aware why certain productions are located outside of the European Union. And I think this is just a populist way uh, to prepare for uh, upcoming elections. And that's something I personally uh, would not uh, support at all. So in trade relationships, we can, of course, feel the geopolitical uh, tectonic plates uh, shifting uh, exceptionally well. So the recently concluded uh, RCEP uh, shows that trade blocks are integrating at a very quick uh, pace. So the youth engagement with the wider Asian uh, region becomes ever more important. So that Taiwan has a role uh, to play in this. And uh, for me, it is a no brainer to finally go ahead. But I, I believe that, uh, that we still have a lot of work to do, make a lot of uh, pressure as well uh, on the European Commission, because we, uh, of course, have uh, uh, um, different uh, geopolitical situations now coming up. Of course, we know as well uh, uh, the so-called Memorandum of Understanding that several members uh, of the European Union signed uh, with China. Uh, this is a weak point, in my opinion, because we don't speak up with one voice uh, towards China, as we do it, for example, at this very moment with the United Kingdom, the European Union, you, uh, that speaks with one voice, this gives us strength. If we are have uh, speak with 27 small voices, this is not being heard at all. That's the first point. And then the second point is, of course, uh, we as the European Union need to get back on track as well uh, with our transatlantic partner, because uh, under Donald Trump, this has suffered. Uh, usually we have uh, had uh, the Airbus Boeing uh, disputes uh, going on. We have now uh, both rulings on the table. So I think it is uh, time now to get back on the negotiating table uh, to really find the solutions there and then as well engage in uh, our multilateral ag agenda, which in principle can be allied. I think that is very uh, important. So we have uh, as well uh, to uh, face the global challenges uh, together because otherwise, of course, there is uh, a, a huge uh, a huge competitor that is not always playing uh, by the rules. I don't have to name it, but I'm probably you know uh, which one I'm talking about. So I, for me personally, it is really uh, a no-brainer to finally go ahead with the BIA uh, with uh, Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is one of the very few uh, economies in the world that actually has even uh, during this pandemic um, managed to have economic growth. I think it's uh, a little bit more than 2% that the economy uh, is growing in all the other, in the whole European Union, we are going down, but Taiwan is going up. I think that is very a uh, good signal where we should uh, as well uh, clinch in now and uh, get this dynamic as well in our relationship because then uh, we have potential on both sides and that is very uh, important and I'm very much uh, looking uh, forward uh, to the discussion even though I could probably can't uh, stay until the very end. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Hansen. Uh, these are very encouraging words. Um, and you also mentioned uh, the need to speak up uh, to China with one voice. I, I saw you actually at the parliament uh, uh, mentioning this to all the parliamentarians that we need this China task force um, in, the, uh, in the parliament. Maybe we also need a specific uh, Taiwanese task force because you say you put a lot of pressure on the parliament and indeed uh, this is what the commission is doing so well. Unfortunately, as I said at the beginning, the new Commissioner for Trade, Dombrovsky, said in October that a BIA with uh, Taiwan will have to wait the outcome of very uncertain discussions, as we know, with uh, the People's Republic. 
so um, you know uh, things on that side uh, don't seem to move and then as I said at the beginning this shows that the EU the executive arm is still stuck with the fact that they do not want to trespass these red lines imposed by uh, by China and um, I wonder whether at the European Parliament you can you think there would be a majority to push um, uh, the the executive arm and uh, including the of course the external action service to a more um, assertive role and to as Borrell basically said we can discuss about what um, the the um, strategic autonomy means but by all means let's discuss but give it a practical uh, practical application um, so do you think there is you can gather enough support in the parliament to push for Taiwan well, I believe in uh, the Parliament is definitely not uh, the weak point. I think the weak point here is definitely the Commission and as well the Council, because as I said, there are a lot of uh, individual member states that have a certain um, relations uh, with China. And there is, uh, you mentioned uh, just before, for example, Slovakia, when there there is something uh, not pleasing to uh, China, there are certain repercussions. And that's why uh, certain member states in the Council are very reluctant uh, because they fear, of course, uh, uh, retaliation and measures uh, that uh, they are uh, companies in China would suffer. So that's why uh, this is uh, not going uh, in this direction in the Council and in the Commission. But on the other hand, me personally, I would say we have uh, to take uh, the um, uh, the bull by the, by the horns, and uh, I think uh, the United States made a, a big move as well already to uh, to uh, towards Taiwan. I think that's the way forward. We have to not just wait until uh, this giant finally gets somewhere on our line, because the giant is just not moving as uh, as quickly and as at, at uh, and foremost not as far as we would expect it so that's why i think we have to go uh, do the things the other way around we have do, done the, the other things around the other way around when we concluded uh, the fta uh, with uh, japan in 2018 when we uh, um, when we concluded the um, fta with vietnam i think that is the way forward to get uh, the 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 neighboring, neighboring countries on board with us and then afterwards China at one point will have to move a little bit more and that's why, why, why I say we have to go the other way around, uh, go, do, do, do the ones that want uh, to go ahead with us and those who are too, too reluctant or us asking too much from us, well then they have to wait. So uh, first come first serve, that would be my uh, suggestion and but that of course there we have to make a huge fight uh, um, with the member states that are blocking, that are saying, well, we are waiting what uh, this, the CAI uh, will bring, and then uh, maybe afterwards we move uh, to uh, on something with Taiwan. That, in my opinion, is the wrong way, but the member states have, of course, uh, interests that uh, they uh, don't want to sacrifice, and there I think we have to show them uh, that uh, in the end, uh, uh, there it is better to go to the other way around. Thank you very much, Mr. Hansen, and uh, we let you go back and focus on the, the UK trade agreement. But once that is over, please uh, return your attention to the Taiwan uh, agreement. So um, time to move on to our next panelists. And um, we heard uh, Mr. Izzo make the business case uh, for better relations with, uh, with Taiwan. Um, now, uh, he said, I'm not an expert on trade deals. Our next speaker is very much an expert on trade deals and in a specific area, which is becoming every day more important, that is services. Mr. Pascal Kernes, he's the managing director of the European Services Forum. And uh, for those who don't know the ESF, the European Services Forum is a network of representatives from the European services sector committed to actively promoting the liberalization of international trade and investment in services. Um, Mr. Kernes has a lot of experience and influence, I would say, on the EU's bilateral FTA and investment agreements. So with that, please, Pascal, go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Eric, and uh, thank you, everyone, um, for having me on, on, on this presentation. Um, I'm, I'm uh, maybe I'm an expert on, on trade in services, but I'm not an expert on Taiwan, and I've learned 
a lot of expertise already today, so uh, bear with me. I, I will focus on diversification of the supply chain with Taiwan, maybe by trying to increase awareness uh, on the aspect of the services dimension of the economy, uh, and also maybe to try to encourage more Taiwan to invest into the EU um, than it does now. Um, um, I will have a, a short presentation. I will go very quickly with through it, but uh, it's just to give a support, a visual support to what I'm going to say about the importance of services. Um, the EU uh, GDP 71% in services in Taiwan is 62, which is already very important, but a bit lower than in developed countries. On the labor force, a lot of people in Taiwan are already working in the services sectors. 35% on, on manufacturing and, and industry is very important for a developed economy and maybe one of the ways to try to diversify the economy uh, and the supply chain would be to invest and, and do more into the services sectors. Taiwan is already a very important um, actor into the export of services. It is the 18th uh, into the world, which is very important. But you can see that the European Union is by far the biggest in the world. And that is uh, a very important element for to understand how uh, EU is working and why we are focusing so much on the importance of services. But Taiwan export of services, even if it is a big play already, in the last years are actually trying to diminish its, its, its competitiveness in exporting services. And, and that is maybe showing an example of maybe something should be done to try to do more into export of services uh, in Taiwan to help Taiwan to diversify the economy. And here I have a comparison, which is very important to look at, which is when you look at the first uh, pie here, you can see that only 30.3% of the balance of payment is, is export of services. So all the rest of the export of Taiwan is focused on goods. And that is a very low level for services in the world. In the, the average in the world is 20%, and the average in a developed economy is about 30%. The EU is 32%. So Clearly, Taiwan is not really believing into services, and that might be a problem for this economy in the future. Nevertheless, when you look at the trade in value uh, uh, added, which is the second pie, you can see that when you incorporate the services around the products, 40% of all export of, of Taiwan are services, which means that there is a lot of potential in increasing the services around the products in the manufacturing uh, of Taiwan. If I look at the bilateral trade between the two, a country, the EU and, and Taiwan, goods um, on one side and services on the other side, the exports are growing uh, in both sides. Uh, so uh, contrary to the stagnation of export uh, of services by Taiwan to the rest of the world, it has increased into the last six years by 25% to the European Union. But the bigger problem is relies on the fact that nevertheless, the services I mentioned is very, very um, little compared to the average of the world, uh, other countries in the world. EU export of services to Taiwan is only 18% of total trade, and Taiwan services export to the EU is a, only 11 So clearly there is a, a problem here because that, that is not reflecting what we have in the rest of the world. So the services I mentioned in Taiwan and the economy of Taiwan is not well understood and not well pushed. If I go to the foreign direct investment with the European Union, in the European Union and Taiwan. I've heard other figures today, so I have checked these figures in the in, in the in the Eurostat um, balance of payment uh, FDI position um, uh, database recently. The um, uh, export, so the, the upward foreign direct investment to Taiwan has continued in, uh, uh, increasing in the last years. Not that is not the case for for. Uh, the Taiwanese investment to the European Union. So clearly, even if it would be the 8 billion which have been mentioned, I have the feeling that Taiwan is not sufficiently believing into the um, be investing into the European Union. And if, if there is no proper investment uh, into the European Union, there is a complication to diversify the supply chain. The EU has been mentioned already many times, is the biggest exporter or biggest investor into Taiwan uh, in terms of FDI. But when you look the other way around, we can see that Taiwan is essentially interested in investing in China. And, and, and the 2% of Taiwan investing into the EU uh, is, is showing that there is a problem that 
I believe China, Taiwan is not sufficiently believing into the EU. I'm not talking here about the government. I'm talking here about the business. The business is not putting its money into the EU. Into the EU. Now, in 2013, it was 64% to China. So it has diminished a bit in 2017. So maybe uh, there is a bit more. And the EU used to be 1%, and in 2017, it was 2%. So maybe there is an increase, but not sufficiently. Um, now, if I take out China, I can see that clearly, and it has been already said, mentioned, including by my friend uh, C.C. Chen, um, uh, and one business is believing more investing into the United States or in Japan than into the EU. The trend is good. Clearly, the EU is not there on the map. So we have to do something. What could we do? Um, clearly, the investment by, China, by Taiwan to the European Union or into the, into the EU 75% into services sectors, so the professional services, the technical, bio, the financial institution, uh, information, IT, wholesale, etc. But the average in the world of inward investment into the EU by other countries into the EU, including by China, by the way, is more than 84%. And that is showing that in Taiwan is not investing into services into the EU. So maybe one of the way to do a more, a more relationship between the EU and Taiwan uh, could be um, a better increase of believing into services and believing into investment into the EU. Giuseppe has mentioned all the different problems. I'm not going to go back to that, but um, I think that we should be able to try to attract uh, more investment from Taiwan and ourselves investing more into Taiwan if we believe more into the services part. Now, the question is, is we EU willing to engage with Taiwan? Uh, we have mentioned uh, uh, the different uh, uh, um, efforts which have been done. Uh, the trade for all um, communication by the European previous communication was, was saying that, yes, it wanted to open negotiation about lateral investment with Taiwan. But is this new commission, this new so-called geopolitical commission and the new high, uh, high uh, representative believing into, into doing a business, uh, doing investment with China? That is, I think, a very important question. We are, we are said that we should conclude the investment with China, the, the, the comprehensive agreement on investment with China. Uh, I heard the, the negotiators this week, um, they are close, but there are still a lot of political willingness to move into this, both sides. So it's not clear whether we're going to do that. If it is not possible, does it mean that the EU will not look at all of having an agreement with, tai with Taiwan. I think that is something that we should, uh, we don't want. The EU business do believe into Taiwan. The EU uh, business has put its, its voice to have a bilateral investment with Taiwan because of all the good reasons which have been mentioned earlier. And um, as far as the, the Open Services Forum is concerned, we have put our voice into the uh, uh, communication we did to the new commission, to the new uh, um, member of the parliament when they came in in 2015, and now into the new trade policy review. We are saying that we should engage with, with uh, Taiwan to have uh, an agreement with them. Um, the question has been put to see whether they will change much uh, an agreement because it is true we have like-minded countries we have a rule of law we have open uh, markets uh, essentially although for services i still have some some questions and that something better should be done so we could increase the market access uh, into services into into the, the bilateral investment agreement there is also a need to increase possibility for, to invest into public procurement into taiwan which are still restricted even if taiwan is part of the uh, gpa and wto but i think what is much more important we want such an agreement to give a signal to the business and to, in particular, to the business of Taiwan that it is safe and it is possible uh, and welcome to invest into uh, the European Union. So an agreement of bilateral investment agreement between you and Taiwan for me would be essentially to increase the visibility of the EU and Taiwan relationship. The, the visibility with the US is very open, uh, but but the EU is not much really on the map in, in Taiwan, and that will increase trust. So I will I will stop here just by saying that yes, I think, uh, and I thank you very much, the European Parliament and Christopher Hansen to to uh, do this lobbying to, toward the Commission and to the Council. But we have to continue, and the business also, the European business uh, has to mobilize itself to continue to push for such an agreement uh, with Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal. Um, 
the main message is, of course, that you say Taiwan is not sufficiently believing in investing in the European Union, but the world is a big uh, beauty contest and it means we have to do our best, we have to show that we're well. But, you know, we heard uh, Mr. Izzo uh, mention a number of factors this morning where we could uh, do uh, our best a little bit more, where we could improve. He mentioned high, the high taxes and everything. So um, we have to uh, definitely do our best and obviously the BIA would uh, help. Um, at this stage, uh, I think we... Um, I see that we're being joined by another member of parliament, uh, Mr. Sean Kelly. I would like to, uh, to go to the uh, Q&A. I hope we still have basically 10 minutes. Maybe we overrun a little bit for five minutes, if possible. But I would first like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Sean Kelly uh, to uh, come and also um, address uh, this uh, webinar. Um, Mr. Sean Kelly is an Irish uh, MEP, also from the Christian Democrats party. Um, he, uh, he has recently had a very positive response from the parliament when he reported on the suggestions um, of uh, his commission in the parliament on promoting the relations with Asia and he included reference to Taiwan. Um, he's the key man, uh, by the way, at the parliament for the relations with ASEAN and you know that we have just, uh, as Europeans, the EU uh, signed a uh, strategic or a, a very close partnership agreement with the ASEAN countries. Uh, I also must mention that on a personal level, uh, I hear that Mr. Kelly has just received the award from his fellow parliamentarians as being the best researcher for work he did in his committee on industry, research and energy. So Mr. Kelly, um, please give us your comments. You're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. So thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. And I would like to firstly thank Ambassador Tai of Taiwan Mission and the European Institute for Asian Studies for the invitation to speak to you here today on what I consider a pivotal topic. There is no doubt that 2020 has been a difficult year and although its place in the history books is set, the path on which to follow is its wake or not. Yes, the lockdowns in China at the start of the year caused output contractions that were felt around the world for months. Reflecting the role it has in global supply chains, travel and commodity markets, it is clear that we can no longer have such dependence on one or two countries in key markets. Yet even with calls for reshoring self-sufficiency and frankly protectionism, I strongly believe trade will be an essential factor in global economic recovery. Countries that are open to international trade grow faster, innovate, improve productivity and provide higher income and more opportunities for their people. Integrating the world economy through trade and global value chains helps drive economic growth and reduce poverty. This is not a time to restrict trading. It's the opposite, as I said. That means building strong alliances with partners who commit to multilateral rules and a level playing field. Here I feel the EU-Taiwan relationship still has much further potential to grow, especially with our common commitment to freedom and democracy, which cannot be underestimated. The European Union is in a strong position in many ways due to the openness of our trade regime. We have a secured legal investment framework that is amongst the most open in the world and provide investors is a stable, sound and predictable environment. This allows Europe to become deeply integrated into global markets. My own country, Ireland, is similar to Taiwan in many ways. A small island of a large continent with many other similarities. We have export driven economies that have ensured a higher standard of living for our citizens and transformed our countries. The first ever EU investment forum in 2020 co-organized by the European Economic and Trade Office and Taiwan, was, was held in Tapae on the 22nd of September. It has rightfully been described as a very successful event with more than 1,400 participants in attendance, including leading business representations from both sides. In this respect, I believe that an EU-Taiwan BIA and a potentially EU-Taiwan economic partnership will bring further mutual benefits 
especially as we consider that the pandemic would not reverse the trend of globalization in an increasingly interconnected world. Executive Vice President Ambroskis stating in his hearing, in an answer to a question from me, that his immediate priority is to finalize the investment agreement with China, with China and once there is more clarity in its content, then a focus could be given to a BIA with Taiwan. While I can understand this logic to a certain degree, I think that the Commission should start this scoping exercise on bilateral investment agreement and possibly even start negotiations when possible, even if this is in parallel with discussions with China. And this is something that I want to see happening. And I think it's something that you are in a position, I think, to influence so that we in the Parliament can put pressure on the Commission to do this. I feel that waiting until discussions with China are over, there could be a clause put in there that might not be in the best interest of EU-Taiwan relations. Also, as you said, Eric, I am the standing rapporteur on the ASEAN region, the EU's third largest trading partner outside Europe. I believe we can develop further economic ag agreements with other countries in the ASEAN region that will offer a huge potential for European businesses. In this sense, Taiwan should also be incorporated, where possible, into the EU Asia connectivity, be that with increased investment and trade flows, as well as people to people connectivity through the likes of education programs. I saw also in some of the points made initially, and I think the US Taiwan supply chain partnership is a model on which the European Union should build. And I think if the EU and the US follow similar approaches in their dealings with China, China will not be in a position to sideline what we want to do. I think the strength of the EU acting in one voice and the US together, and now I think with a new president coming into office in the United States, that sense of cooperation can develop, and especially if we can come to the same uh, philosophy and the same approach in relation to both China and Taiwan, without excluding one or the other, then I think that's the way forward. That's something I'll be looking to do in my work here in the European Union over the next couple of years. I wish you well. I admire what you are doing. And to Ambassador Tai and others, I look forward to meeting you in person when the vaccine takes hold in the new year. And also, as some speakers have already said, it has been noted worldwide how well you dealt with the coronavirus in Taiwan. That's just an indication of how beneficial it is to any country to be dealing with you because you are well ahead in many respects and we can learn from you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Um, thank you. Straightforward advice uh, to the executive arm of the European Union. Uh, we're um, running a little bit out of time, but still I would like to, if possible, bundle a few questions. Um, and that is about trade agreements. We've seen recently, and it has shaken a little bit uh, the, on the, the European side, that um, Taiwan is not joining in this um, RCEP, that is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, where uh, ASEAN countries, Australia, and you know, uh, a big uh, important um, uh, free trade agreement in Asia, um, Taiwan was not included. We've seen at the beginning that Minister Chen showed this very nice slide with all these FTAs um, done by the EU and uh, Taiwan um, somewhere in the sea without any agreement, also excluded from uh, our step. Um, the question then is, uh, Minister Chen, um, how do you feel about uh, not being included in RCEP? And also, um, I see questions coming in here about the possibility that uh, Taiwan would do something uh, with the UK. Uh, it seems there have already been about 20 uh, discussions with the UK about a, uh, a trade agreement. Um, so uh, I asked Hansen whether we would have earlier um, an, a trade agreement with uh, Taiwan than with uh, the UK. But um, I wonder here whether Taiwan would uh, possibly even move faster on the UK side than uh, with the EU. What are the comments there? Please, Mr. Chen. RCEP, let me make uh, several comments. First of all, 
EU is our fifth largest trade partner, and we are EU's fifth largest partner in Asia. And despite our FTA coverage rate is only less than 2%, however, Taiwan is 20th largest trading nation in the world. That proves something. Number one, Taiwan is so resilient and tenacious in its economy and it's uh, as a partner for supply chain. So even though we are reversely discriminated by other trading partners, where they give preferential trade terms to other partners, but not to Taiwan, yet we make a good business. Number two, those are regional trade agreements. They are somewhat economic and somewhat political. Taiwan is politically very lonely, but economically we are still popular. And number three, with the EU, it's more all the more evident that a agreement, a permanent piece of document with Taiwan makes sense because that's part of EU's strategic autonomy policy. Uh, EU needs to take a difficult decisions to stand up for the value and to stand up what those trade agreements make sense to the EU. And finally, uh, we have a very detailed internal assessment of Taiwan being excluded from the RCEP. Number one, RCEP is being uh, China's there and facing the reality. Uh, we, we value our democracy and our liberal economic order more than being able to join a club. And number two, uh, some of the industrial sectors will be impacted by the uh, RCEP, which will be primarily on petrochemical, uh, textile, and steel. Uh, while we we would the government would do its utmost best effort to help the industry to maintain their trade relations with our ASEAN trade partners. And come to the second question on the UK. Uh, as I work for the uh, Taiwanese government, and now is in a very exciting timing between EU and UK. Uh, please indulge with me. Uh, I will refrain myself from uh, taking any position on the uh, UK Thank issues. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Chen. Um, it's, uh, we're already running over time, so um, at this point I would like to ask the other speakers to make uh, some final comments if they feel like uh, doing that. Mr. Izzo? The mic is not yeah, on. It's okay now. I, I would like to come back to the point that the EU should attract more investments from Taiwan. Um, and uh, once again, the BIA would be a starting point. It's not uh, an ending uh, point of a process. It's a starting point. Um, the sectors where Taiwan can, uh, uh, can contribute to the uh, development of Europe are clearly in the digital world. Europe is nowhere in digital. Okay. Europe does not have software, does not have hardware. Okay, So we do not have uh, an operating system made in Europe. We do not have a search engine made in Europe on the software side. And we have lost the entire uh, hardware uh, industries, Okay, from computing platforms to mobile phones that were even invented in Europe. Okay, And uh, therefore, uh, this has to be redone. It has to be redone and aligned with Taiwan could be a good start. Right? So uh, the, the Taiwanese are champions. I, I say that when I drive from Taipei to the airport in Tao Yuan, that is about 40, 50 kilometers, in this stretch of land, there are at least 150 cham world champions for what they do. And attracting some of them to Europe would be a plus, would be an asset for Europe. Okay, And uh, then uh, to, to, to do so, we have to to overcome the inconsequentiality of the European politics. Okay, not that one day is one person in charge and, and there is there is a positive uh, attitude towards Taiwan, and next five years there is an, another guy that will completely disregard what has been done. That doesn't work like that, okay? Especially not in business, okay? So, uh, therefore, I I would like to 
to, uh, to make sure that this is understood. And I also would like to highlight that that the, the EU Europeans, EU or non-EU, European investments in Taiwan are twice as much as the Americans. This is not, not a clear key indicator because the American IPO is by far higher than, than the, the, the European IPO. Okay, the American IPO may account for 50% of the Taiwanese exports. Okay, so it's not a congruous comparison. So it's clear that the Europeans create more jobs in uh, Taiwan, but the Americans create more wealth. Okay, so it's, uh, it's uh, as we always say, the, devils, the devil is in the details. Okay, and these details have to be understood well from this point of view. So uh, I, once again, I, I, uh, I believe, uh, and because I see what happens in Italy, okay, more clearly than uh, the rest of Europe, uh, the situation is dramatic already and going to be even worse huh, uh, for the years to come. Uh, so it's important that Europe reconceptualize completely the concept of the digital world in particular and moves together with some allies, okay, tries to attract some investments into Europe. And I do believe Taiwan could be a perfect partner. Thank you, Mr. Izzo. Is there any other final words? Well, if not, then um, I think, uh, well, let's conclude uh, the seminar um, with what we just heard from uh, Minister Chen, um, that even if excluded from these um, free trade agreements, um, Taiwan is thriving despite the hardship. And uh, um, clearly, Europe can alleviate this hardship um, and we would also benefit from it. So let's go for that. And with these words, I would like to hand back the screen to uh, to Lynn uh, in Brussels. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everybody. Um, yes, also on my side, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists, um, to uh, all the participants as well for listening in. I think a lot of uh, new topics and other topics to be um, addressed in the next couple of months have been brought forward. Um, let's say, well, the digital aspect, the aspect of semiconductors, um, RCEP, and of course, the EU ASEAN strategic partnership. So um, I would say, well, stay tuned and we will be coming up with uh, a lot more other topics and discussions in the next couple of months. So thanks a lot to everyone. And uh, we hope to see you soon, live or online. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Ciao, -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.